first secretary and deputy head of mission at the Embassy of Jordan in Brussels and the mission of Jordan to the EU and NATO. Mr. Krasat holds a bachelor's degree in economics, uh, which he completed in 1994, as well as a master's degree in diplomatic studies from 2000 until 2001 from the Mediterranean Academy of Diplomatic Studies at the University of Malta. Mr. Krasat's political career started already in 1999 during his service at the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs in Amman, Jordan. Mr. Krasat has had numerous positions in the economic, negotiations, media, protocol, consular, and European affairs departments. He has served previously in two diplomatic missions in Ottawa, Canada, Canada from 2002 until 2006, and in Tokyo, Japan from 2006 until 2009. Currently, Mr. Krasad is serving as the first secretary and deputy head of mission at the Embassy of Jordan in Brussels and the mission of Jordan to the EU and also to NATO. The lecture topic that he has chosen today, let me read it to make sure I'm correct, is cultural diplomacy in the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very warm welcome for Mr. Men Krasad. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Donfried. I wish first of all to thank the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, ICD, for the kind invitation and for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, in fact, I had uh, plenty of uh, hesitance before I decide on what to speak. And uh, in fact, I feel challenged by the uh, last statement by the uh, Hungarian MEP. So I decided to scratch a little bit of my speech and try to speak more directly on uh, more contemporary issues and uh, to link my uh, presentation, which was a little bit theoretical and general, to uh, real life examples. I, I have uh, worked previously on uh, Euro-Mediterranean issues and I like this topic. And um, through this gate, I think we can link the uh, European cultural diplomacy to our region uh, in a regional or international context. So please allow me to uh, brief you uh, with a brief introduction, then we can uh, directly go to the topic. Uh, cultural diplomacy is a domain of diplomacy that has increased importance over the past few decades. Cultural diplomacy can be viewed as both a means of developing and sustaining relations with other states through culture, art, and education, and also as a means of promoting states' institutions, value system, and culture at a bilateral and multilateral level. Military power has to a great extent lost its appeal. This is especially true in Europe after the destruction brought by, about by both world wars. Since the end of the Second World War, countries have preferred to use of soft power in their foreign relations. Soft power is described by political scientist Joseph Nye as the ability to persuade through culture, values, and ideas, as opposed to hard power, which conquers or coerces through military might. Cultural diplomacy also falls into the category of soft power. In the European Union, the concern over cultural relations comes both at a national level, practiced individually by member states, and also at a supranational level exercised by the European Union itself as a whole. Although one of the primary objectives of the European Union on the world stage is to speak unite on behalf of all member states, most actions in the domain of cultural diplomacy have not been coordinated between these member states, but rather initiated separately through their own institutions. Several EU member states have also been successful in positioning themselves culturally and linguistically across the globe through particular institutions. The three EU member states with perhaps the most impressive histories of cultural diplomacy in terms of the involvement in the everyday activities of the European Union are indeed France, the United Kingdom, and Germany. Where France is viewed as the pioneer of modern cultural diplomacy. In addition, Spain and Italy have also their own successful experience in this domain. In technical terms, cultural diplomacy could be defined as any means available to foster mutual understanding varying from the exchange of ideas, information, beliefs, and other aspects of culture realized in the fields of art, 
sports, literature, music, science, and the economy. This could be anything we can practice besides politics and war. To implement that, communication and respect between the cultures should, should, shall be observed with full respect of mutual values for the sake of interaction and cooperation in the view of achieving long-term benefits, promoting trade and foreign investment, and to be recognized as such, culture, cultural diplomacy requires that each party recognizes the distinct culture of the other with equal rights on equal terms. Cultural diplomacy fails when one party fails to observe this understanding. And this failure might slide to cultural imperialism. Art has also become nowadays the global industry used besides cultural diplomacy practice under diplomacy, traditional diplomacy. Cultural diplomacy of a government can also be bear the problem of presenting one prevailing culture in a state and marginalizing another one. It is a big responsibility to make the balance. I intended, in fact, to talk a little bit about the three models of cultural diplomacy, which are, in my case, France, UK, and Germany. But I will skip this and will keep for people who are interested in the paper later on. And I will go directly to the regional context and the European project. As previously mentioned, member states of the European Union, particularly France, UK, Germany, have each developed and sustained mechanisms and institutions through which to exercise cultural diplomacy in Europe and the rest of the world. Nonetheless, it is worthwhile to note that although each EU member state has had a different experience and approach with regards to cultural diplomacy, the creation of the European Union approach which regards to cultural diplomacy, the creation of, uh, has affected and will continue to affect the scope of cultural diplomacy in Europe. The Union has established a variety of initiatives in the field of cultural diplomacy, each of which at least partially demonstrates a shared European voice with regards to culture, cultural dialogue, and cooperation. Of these initiatives, I can mention the Euromed Heritage Program, the Anna Lynn Foundation, which is a Euromed common initiative, and the European Union National Institutes of Culture. In the case of Anna Lind Foundation, the Euromed Foundation for the Dialogue Between Cultures, shortened to the Anna Lind Foundation, is a network of civil society, which aim to promote intercultural dialogue in the Mediterranean region, my region, and yours. The Annaline Foundation was set up in 2005 by the governments of the Euromed Partnership and headquarters in Alexandria, Egypt. One of its primary objectives is to bring the people together from across the Mediterranean to improve mutual respect between cultures. Another objective is to facilitate and support the action of civil society of the Euromed region in the fields promoted of the shared values and common future. The foundation's successful developing of a network of over 3,000 civil society organizations, which is a lot. I wish to quote the Dutch Liberal Member of European Parliament, Mrs. Mariti Schaak, who recently presented a, a report on cultural diplomacy, making some recommendations for the European Union in this domain. Among the suggestions provoked by, pro, proposed by Mrs. Ishaq is her report on the idea of a cultural administrator to be dispatched to each EU representation in the world. This representative would deal with the coordination of cultural programs and actions and promote for the concept of brand Europe, one Europe or one identity if possible which would be anchored in European values such as the respect of human rights, freedom, and democracy, and would secure Europe's role on the global cultural player. She describes brand Europe as switching the thinking in terms of Europe and the world, as opposed to highlighting the difference, differences between member states. This would strengthen the EU's position on the global stage. In March 2011, the European Parliament's Culture Committee 
asked the European Commission to strengthen the role of culture in the EU's external policy. MEPs highlighted the importance of cultural cooperation with non-EU countries as a way to advance Europe's interest and values in the world, notably of these of democracy and human rights. In order to streamline fragmented national budgets and policies, MEPs asked for a common EU strategy on culture implemented via a specific department of the European External Action Service, which is the equivalent of the Foreign Affairs of Europe. The European Parliament also asked for an EU cultural ambassador to, the, to be appointed, and as requested by Madame Schaak, for one person to be designated in each EU representation overseas to take care of cultural relations and promote European culture. To conclude, nowadays where, the, where currency fails, where economies fail, where military fails, where politics fails, you, you still need the cultural diplomacy working and breathing and sustaining what is supposed to be achieved. Proponents of developing a European cultural identity argue that the EU actions have been des designed to reflect the rich cultural diversity of Europe and to complement rather than compete with the actions of member states. They also emphasize that collective and coordinated EU action would have beneficial impacts on the global presence of the EU in several areas, notably building sustainable culture, cultural cooperation with countries beyond the EU, strengthening understanding between peoples through intercultural dialogue and promoting Europe, Europe's exper expertise and heritage. They also argue that Europe has a rich cultural diversity, which indeed should be preserved. However, European culture is also a manifestation of certain universal values, such as freedom of expression, human rights, and democracy. In fact, the advantages of soft power as a more effective means of government for governments to pursue influence are evident. Cultural diplomacy has taken its place in the world, although a common mechanism for, for it within the European Union has yet to be established most EU member states share similar objectives with regards to their foreign cultural policies. These objectives include developing cultural relations, enhancing program aid in developing countries, and certain and informed, and if possible, favorable picture of their culture to the outside world. If these similarities can be highlighted and developed, a new cultural identity may be soon emerge in the European Union. Thank you for your listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really appreciated your perspectives, especially given the role that Jordan continues to play, really as an intermediary and cultural diplomat in so many ways. So excellent to have you here. Uh, I'd be happy to take uh, questions or comments from any of you. Please. Okay. Uh, my name is Marina Vesa. I come from uh, Latvia, and um, I currently study uh, protocol diplomacy and cross-cultural relations at uh, the ISPD here in Brussels. And uh, what I would like to ask you that um, during these days we've uh, heard a lot uh, that uh, uh, artists are much better diplomats uh, because uh, they can speak uh, freely uh, and they are more open-minded. So uh, don't you think, or how is it from your perspective that uh, maybe the traditional uh, concept of diplomacy is uh, somehow failing and needs to be adjusted uh, because um, uh, the traditional diplomats are put in uh, more strict uh, frames. And um, the other question, if we just have time, maybe you just briefly sketch uh, the three models of uh, uh, the cultural diplomacy that you didn't mention in the presentation. Thank you. Well, um I should agree no less with you that the artists are better than diplomats. Uh, they uh, amuse us with their music, with their uh, ingenuity, where they're. We don't uh, lose time by uh, listening to music or watching a piece of art. But in the case of diplomats, also they have a mission, uh, a mission and a goal. Um, indeed, the traditional role of a diplomat has changed tremendously 
through the last 15 years, I can say, with the development of communication and uh, the, especially the internet. And even the diplomats' behavior has changed with that. Uh, we we ha can conduct nowadays diplomacy through different means. Let's say conference diplomacy, which like today's. Uh, you can find the um, high boots diplomats in Afghanistan negotiating with the Taliban and other uh, areas, rough areas, but they still have the same goal, to promote the interest, to defend, defend their country's interest, interest and the, to uh, conclude with peace, to promote the idea of peace in the world. Um, the three models uh, that I, um, I wanted to talk about are the most obvious for me. I'm, I'm not an expert in culture, but I had the um, honor of representing my country in the cultural domain in the past few years uh, in different continents, in North America, in Asia, in Europe. And still every day, a diplomat in his behavior, in his or her behavior, in their activities, in their uh, communion with other colleagues, with the, with the society, they represent the culture of their own country. So it's a living example every day on how we behave and how we uh, transmit our uh, message. That's what I want to say. If any, uh, Thank you very much. Question, yes. Other questions or comments? Do you think the cultural diplomacy can also be uh, applied and can be more uh, uh, active in the, in the Arab world since we, we have the same language and we have the same culture almost? Well, this is a tough question because uh, we have also distinct uh, cultures within the Arab world. I can give an example of just one neighboring country which has over 18 ethnicities and religious uh, sects, you know, uh, in the Middle East. So we, we are a diverse uh, community in the Arab world. We are not a unique racial or a religious uh, group, but still, cultural diplomacy is practiced every day through art, uh, through uh, language uh, understanding, through uh, joint missions, through inter uh, exchange of students, through endless means. And I think that the, uh, the Arab-Arab dialogue is as much important as the Arab-European dialogue, um, especially when the um, Arab countries are going into, through the cultural crisis. It's not only a political crisis, it's also a cultural crisis. Uh, because we, ha we are all redefining what we believe in, in terms of our uh, projects. Uh, we are redefining our beliefs. We are redefining and rereading our culture in a way that we want to improve, we want to excel, we want to link with the outside world in some communities, especially the closed communities. So you, I think you're right, we need more of uh, an intra-dialogue than we do uh, also as an inter-cultural -commu dialogue. Yes, I think, I think so. Thank you, I think the next question is in the front and then we'll go to the back again, please. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for your lecture. I'm Georgia Kotia from uh, Greece. Greece. And yes, and yes. I want to ask you, uh, you referred uh, in your lecture to the soft power. I suppose you mean the new social media, uh, like Google, Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, etc. We know that today the information multiplies through this media. How is it important for you to use social media to share globally? your culture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, if I can just reflect uh, for a moment on the uh, question of media, it's way beyond my abilities to answer that question, because I'm just uh, a, a functionary, a diplomat who, can, who tries to transmit through the media. So the media is much bigger than my role. It's much stronger, and it has its own agenda. It doesn't have to uh, conform to my uh, goals, but I will as a diplomat, try all the time to attract the attention of the media. Um, in the case of smaller states, like Greece and Jordan, for example, we are small states, uh, we don't have this uh, luxury of controlling such a soft power. We don't have lots of uh, 
uh, satellite stations that uh, transmit or the, um, the broadcast in all world languages. We don't have the budget to finance the big uh, media projects or uh, the uh, programs, but still we can attract the attention in certain areas, especially with the um, comparative advantage that we have in our rich history. For example, I cannot speak for Greece, but you will, but I will speak for Jordan, which is a modern political state, but with a history of more than 10,000 years old. Uh, so uh, Jordan and Palestine, they share a lot of uh, history together. I can speak about that, and this will still attract so many people to listen to my message, although from big uh, media institutions. I don't have to control them, but I can attract them. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll go back to the middle, please. Um, I'm recalling that during the afternoon we heard the thesis that um, culture is not in the competence of the community. How do you think would a national ambassador react to an or a European ambassador promoting culture? It's in fact another tough question that I will try to answer briefly. Um, Europe is succeeding every day. Every day they find solutions for problems. All the big problems are yet still to be discussed tomorrow in the Council. Uh, however, uh, economics is not everything. Money is not everything. We need to talk about other things. Um, in the case, for example, of the Arab Spring, the, the EU found a way to dispatch uh, a representative, a special representative of Madame Ashton, which is Mr. Bernardino Lyon, to take care of the uh, political aspect of the Arab Spring and the developments in the Arab world and to represent the EU. They found out also how to deal with certain um, details. They dispatched task forces to countries like Tunisia. It was a success. So Europe made a success in, in these uh, uh, areas. Why not in culture? Culture is the message. In fact, we need understanding between both shores of the Mediterranean. And uh, there are lots of things to, to see and to learn about Europe. Uh, we don't have to be uh, egoistic and go uh, and insist that, okay, uh, if 50% of the um, identity of France or Germany is not represented in this cultural identity, I will withdraw. I will not support such a project. But we should accept at, at least the minimum uh, agreement, which is the common position of Europe. Europe is working on common positions. And through dialogue, there is a minimum of at least what is considered a European identity. For me, in the south of the Mediterranean, there I, I see a European identity forming in the north. However, um, it's not so delicate for me to how to analyze this identity. But I can see you have part of that European uh, identity. Either sometimes it's ethnic, sometimes it's cultural, how we express our everyday uh, life, but there is a room for agreement or minimum uh, common position for a cultural identity, I think so. Um, I'd like to ask you for a Jordanian perspective on uh, cultural diplomacy and how your country actually tries to exercise it. Uh, like, I would like to, well, it would be great if you could give us maybe some more information or on uh, some student exchange programs or other artistic programs or um, uh, projects uh, that your country, through which your country actually tries to exercise uh, cultural diplomacy. Thank you. This is time to speak a little bit about Jordan. Um, Jordan is careful and is uh, paying enough attention to be part of any initiative that the Euro-Mediterranean region is forming. Uh, from the beginning, we took part in the uh, Annaline Foundation. Uh, we have existing programs, exchange programs uh, with uh, Europe or uh, at least uh, subsidized or being taken care of the European Union. Uh, we have also regional programs that the European Union is financing. For example, I can mention uh, one of them, the Seeds of Peace. Sometimes there are the, uh, the uh, other programs like um, um, the uh, Erasmus Mundus programs. We are part of that as well. We dispatch uh, uh, tens of uh, Jordanian uh, students to the European universities. We are trying to engage in the Bologna process as well. 
to make it easier for Jordanians to be accepted within the European Union for the um, equivalence of uh, their degrees. Uh, we have even younger uh, generations, the youth in general, they, they have uh, they gain importance within the uh, mutual uh, relations with the European Union. I am sorry, I don't have the exact numbers of students, but I, I think in my paper I mentioned few programs that Jordan is part of. Um, the civil society, in fact, is uh, doing a lot of work that the governments are not doing anymore. And they're like taking care of such smaller programs, and this is the thing that the EU is uh, directing their finances towards these days, the engagement of civil society. Um, youth education, uh, child rights, women's rights, uh, the uh, environment of the, um, for example, the Jordan River and uh, saving the Jordan River uh, uh, the, from uh, environmental degradation. Um, the, uh, for example, there, there are bilateral agreements also conducted between each member state and Jordan, plus the European sponsored programs. So uh, if we gather all these and, and at a certain point, I remember also that Jordan was ready to sponsor or to be a, a pilot country in promoting the, the Euromed cultural strategy, which did not uh, take part yet. It's not established yet because of the um, obstacles in the Middle East peace process and the other regional uh, crises. But on both levels, government and uh, civil society, Jordan is, I think, engaged in a, an acceptable way. And wherever there's a chance to, uh, to do an exchange program or to send students or to host students in Jordan, uh, it, it is possible for us to, to go ahead. There is uh, no, no obstacle about that. Thank you very much. Other questions or comments? In the meantime, maybe I'll uh, take the liberty of posing a question myself. Uh, cultural diplomacy is a field where we've really seen a big transition in terms of definitions. Uh, when I first founded the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy in 1999, I must say I was quite skeptical in terms of where really can cultural diplomacy help. Uh, and I said, okay, if you have two countries that want to work together, two countries that are at peace, two countries that have good relations, why not? Academic exchange, you know, sending cultural ambassadors, great. My hesitation always is what do you do if you have two countries or more than two countries that don't want to work together, that aren't at peace, that are having a conflict. And I think that was my big dilemma. Is there really room and space for cultural diplomacy, or what can cultural diplomacy do in those cases? And I think in your speech and also in the questions, you've referred to some very interesting examples uh, where sometimes you know, one would think maybe it's not possible to actually make progress with cultural diplomacy. So I guess my first question to you is, uh, what is your sense? Because I think there you've sort of indirectly referred to a number of situations, but uh, do you think cultural diplomacy really can have an impact also where there's really a direct conflict? Uh, you know, one of the cases we've discussed, Israel-Palestine, for example, you know, such a hot topic. You know, many have given up, there's no solution. You know, could one perhaps make headway there using cultural diplomacy? And if so, what kind of cultural diplomacy? You mentioned academic exchange, etc. My second question is more of a question of definition. What is cultural diplomacy? Uh, for a long time, there was this classical definition, really, that, for example, the Americans would refer to. Cultural diplomacy is winning the hearts and minds of foreign audiences. I don't think that's what you're referring to. Uh, I don't think just trying to win the hearts and minds of this country or that country will probably bring peace in conflict situations. So that's my second question. If you could offer some sort of a, a practical definition, uh, what is cultural diplomacy and how might that apply also in conflict situations? Well, you're giving me more tough questions than I can handle. Yes. Well. I have, first of all, to remind you that I'm not the expert in cultural diplomacy, but I, uh, through this process I was learning as well. Uh, but to answer your second question, what is cultural diplomacy? There is no one definition, in my opinion. Uh, it, it means that we use whatever means possible to embody our identity, to uh, reflect our culture, to extend uh, or to transmit our message to the other side of the table to uh, explain better who we are. And there is no better example than India in the diversity that it has. It has over 253 official languages, uh, endless number of uh, ethnicities, religions, beliefs, many gods, many prophets, many uh, good people. And 
It has also Kanande pioneers in technology. It has uh, artists. I have many friend, uh, Indian friends who are dancers, musicians, uh, fashion uh, designers, very successful people who transmit the message of their country every day to the world, even through a small screen on the internet. Can diplomacy, cultural diplomacy solve conflicts? I don't think so. But it can alleviate the effects of hatred that is uh, in, our, in our minds and hearts. I can give uh, a distant example of Japan and China, where I witnessed how the two countries were at war at a certain point, and they hate the guts of each other, can come together and agree on uh, one thing, to make friends. They decide to become friends. And this lies in our heads. The obstacles are in our heads. And I can uh, remember now what uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau mentioned in his uh, book, The Social Contract. He said, a man was, man was born free, and he's everywhere in chains. And those who think themselves the masters of others are indeed more slaves than they. And it means for me that the obstacle is in our mind. The prejudice that uh, the Hungarian MEP, the Honorable Hungarian MEP talked about is in our minds, not somewhere else. We can always make a pretext why to hate Mark and Mark hate man. But um, if we decide that today we stop hatred and we start solving our problems, this is the best thing we can do for ourselves, for the others, before these small differences become bigger and bigger. And in the case of China, Japan, in the case of Germany, for example, it has a complicated mission to transmit its cultural message toward the world. Why? For two reasons. Basically, the first one is obvious. It's the Nazis' uh, history within Europe, which is really hard sometimes to forget, especially when we have so many survivors of the Holocaust and the uh, war still uh, living amongst us. And the second reason, because Germany is a federal state. It has to reflect so many identities, smaller identities. Uh, in the other case where the UK and France have, they have an easier task, but Germany has a tougher task, but they did it and they succeeded. And Goethe Institute is the living example for a cultural German identity. Although it was meant to keep the Germanization of the German uh, communities within Europe, at the beginning, but it succeeded in the transmitting the German culture uh, everywhere in the world, art, music, etc. just name it. Thank you. I'd like to ask a follow-up question on there, and I know you don't consider yourself an expert as you were saying in cultural diplomacy. I'm also not an expert, I think, here. We're really just in the sense of asking questions. But you were touching on something interesting with your references also to Germany and to Japan. Uh, I think one of the challenges that cultural diplomacy very often needs to, to deal with uh, is how do we embrace our pasts? How do we embrace our histories? And I think there are some countries are more upfront about that than others. Uh, you could argue Germany in many ways has really you know, grappled with their past in terms of a very, let's say, open, uh, a very present way in terms of if you look at all of the Jewish memorials, et cetera. In the, I, don't, I don't know about Jordan, but in the United States, we hear about one chapter of German history again and again in high school when we learn about Germany. So you could argue that's a case really where it's very much, I think, dealt with. Um, Japan, however, you don't hear so much about it. Uh, Italy, for example, you don't hear so much about it. Uh, and it's, it's a very different way how they've kind of moved on. As you know, Japanese culture, very often it's not as common also to apologize. So I just want to ask you this question. Uh, if we're talking also about build or building understanding and trust, um, maybe do you have advice, for example, for the cultural diplomats in the sense, should they kind of ignore the past? Should we be maybe more transparent about trying to discuss also difficult issues? Uh, for a long time, cultural diplomacy was about talking about the positive issues. You know, these are our strengths, these are our successes. Uh, what place do you think there is in cultural diplomacy? First of all, to talk about the past. Uh, second of all, uh, to be able to have discussions also about difficult things. Uh, is there a place in cultural diplomacy for that. And then the final component of this question, uh, what role do you see in terms of reconciliation for cultural diplomacy? Uh, you know, in the past, again, cultural diplomacy was heavily just presenting one culture in a foreign place. Uh, but is there also a possibility of reconciliation within the space of cultural diplomacy? And if so, how? If you have any, any tips, again, uh, maybe from Jordanian experiences or, or perspectives where you've seen, you know, whether it's through sports or through the arts, uh, these kinds of things successfully may be taking place. Well. You're giving me the task of answering so many, uh, to, to so many brilliant ideas, in fact, I should say. But I don't have uh, 
the, the answer for all of them, but I will try to touch upon the, the main ideas. Um, first of all, I believe that history, modern history was written by the victorious, the people who won the war. In the case of uh, the United States and Japan, for example, um, I, I read a few books about uh, the, the uh, war time of, between Japan and uh, uh, the United States, and there were so many inaccuracies in these books. So what the people do is that they don't shy away from the facts, main facts. And don't, don't try to deny them. I don't deny my past, but I should reconciliate my past with my current day and my future. Um, starting with an apology, a deep apology, a sincere apology, is not really difficult if I I am meant to build better relations for the future. I will now go to the case of Palestine and Israel, for example. I think this is the right time for both nations to reconcile, especially when the whole world accepts the two-state solution and uh, the, the for formula of peace. Uh, the Palestinians and their majority, I believe, they want peace with their neighbors to be in peace with them. They accept the state of Israel. And so does every Arab state when they sign the Arab Peace Initiative. We try to reach out to the Israeli people and the Israeli government and to send our message of peace and coexistence. And we still hope that one day soon we will resume negotiations between the two parties and they will find a suitable solution within the framework or the, uh, and the international agreed references of uh, terms of reference of the solution. So I think that we can, yes, reconcile. Every strong nation had uh, some dark uh, stops in, in its history, uh, including the Islamic empire in different stages. It's, it wasn't also al always a, a nice story. There were some uh, bad, moments of the history of each nation because the small nations were consumed or absorbed by the, the uh, aspiration of the greater nations and this is nature of humankind. But what we can do is at least to come into a reconciliation with our ambition. And do it. We have to stop somewhere. Uh, like in the uh, European model, it's, uh, for me it's an example that I can follow. It's uh, the civilian model where Germany, the largest European country, the richest and the strongest economy, and manpower and very well educated, sophisticated people, along with France and other big nations, can sit next to Malta, which I adore, I lived in Malta, I respect, and I know the Maltese people. They have pride and dignity in their identity, not less than the Germans. And they still can sit to next to each other. Malta can preside over the European Union proudly and represent the whole of the European nations. This was for a price, and the price was reconciliation. We can reconciliate, yes. Japan is the first foreign direct investor in China. I don't have the exact figure now, but China replaced the United States as the first trading partner with Japan. And this means something. This means that people are coming more together. Number one learned language in Japan is not English. It is Chinese. So it means that if we define certain objectives, we define certain interests, we need to do this together in a civilized way, we can succeed. And uh, don't forget that humans are similar and we have universal values. And there was no better time in the history of humankind than today. We have the United Nations, we have agreed on so many things. We have get, gotten rid of so many bad things behind us. There are agreement, agreement on, minimal agreement on what we should be, how should we should behave, and what should be done. So we should respect international law. Uh, good borders make good neighbors, so, uh, so to speak. And uh, I'm not sure that I uh, covered all your questions, but I don't have a text about the Jordanian experience, but uh, through sports, one last example I can give. When Jordan and Kuwait were not in good terms, they were not talking to each other after the uh, occupation of Iraq to Kuwait in 1990. A few years later, how could we resume our relations? I think it was through diplomats. 
people, just first secretary, minister, councillor, whatever. These people were in good terms with their Kuwaiti diplomats. And through good relations they kept through the uh, official uh, uh, boycott. But they kept the, their links, the human link. And through these people, we managed to open channels again and to resume talks with, uh, between Jordan and Kuwait. And we reopened our embassy. And nowadays, we witness the, uh, an excellent relationship. Kuwait is number one Arab country investing in Jordan, etc., etc. Thousands of Kuwaiti students in Jordan universities, and so on. Life has to go on. Thank you. Oh, well, that's a, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to take this opportunity also to express my gratitude uh, to you on behalf of all of us for the lecture and also your generosity in responding to my many questions uh, and, you, uh, and reflections. And uh, I very much hope that, uh, inshallah, your optimism uh, will uh, become true. I'm always optimistic. Uh, thank you very much. Keep your okay. fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.